Uh, okay, welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the next Tuesday seminar at the Warsaw University Astronomical Observatory. And today, um, our seminar speaker is here in person, Marek Kowalski from uh, DESI, from Humboldt, Uni Humboldt University, where he actually did his studies, his PhD. Uh, Marek then uh, did his postdoc in Berkeley, working, helping uh, uh, solve Pearl Mutter to get his Nobel Prize. Uh, a bit working on supernovae uh, and then moved back to Germany working at um, Berlin in Berlin and Bonn now is a, a professor in at Humboldt University and at DESI and his interests cover you know optical astronomy supernovae transients uh, ZPF surveys ultrasat ultraviolet and then neutrinos uh, in ice cubes so we're going to hear about this all uh, here by Marek the floor is yours Yes, thank you. So, you uh, thanks for inviting me, and uh, thanks everyone for coming. So, I'm very glad to be in uh, in Warsaw. Actually, it's only my second time, even though my parents were born here in Warsaw, uh, but I was actually born in Bonn in Germany. So, I'm I do speak a little bit of Polish, but just you know at, at the level of a three year old because that's when I stopped actually speaking Polish and. Okay, but anyway, I'm, it's very nice to be here. I always uh, enjoy it. And um, so I will, um, yeah, I will talk about our research, which we are doing. And um, and it's, uh, you will see it's a lot of multi-messenger astronomy. It What I will present today will be focused mostly on neutrinos and optical detections and everything in real time. So uh, let me uh, start because you are mostly, you know, often classical astronomers here let me explain why it's actually useful what we are after so we are trying to uh, study the high energy uh, universe understand really what's going on at the highest energies and the problem is uh, at the highest energies it's uh, it's that the and anyway, I'm talking about energies beyond a GeV you know maybe more like uh, 10 to the 12 um, GeV so 100 um, so uh, 10 to the uh, 12 that's a TeV so 10 to the 15 electron volts that's uh, a PeV at those energies uh, the problem is that the universe becomes opaque uh, to electromagnetic radiation which works so well be at, at low energies at around uh, you know uh, say 10 TeV uh, essentially the universe shuts down at 1 PeV you you can't even see our own uh, galactic center anymore because the, the the photons are scattering of the cosmic microwave background. They're uh, doing pair production e plus e minus, and then they're gone. And so you you cannot study uh, the extra galactic universe and even our galaxy at uh, PeV energies. And um, and so this is this area that that is blacked out in in. Here on this graph. So what you're seeing here is let me use my stick. It really energy, and it's almost the whole sort of spectrum that we have available to uh, you know humans as a function of you know, you know the distance, how far we can look into the universe as a function of the energy. And you know, we are starting here with radio, and you are ending up at 10 to the 20 electron volts and beyond. And that's essentially uh, the highest energy radiation that we see from the universe. So cosmic rays coming from somewhere, we don't know where because they are uh, essentially deflected by magnetic fields, but they hit the Earth. So we know something is producing super high energy radiation here. We just don't know uh, how, how, you know, what processes have been uh, producing them. And, uh, you know, and uh, we don't even know the sources. We essentially don't know anything. So the idea is to actually start exploring this patch, which is dark, and it's not little. It's roughly one quarter of the total spectrum that we have available. And, uh, as you know, we don't really know what's going on uh, in that energy range. And so I think it's a legitimate question, you know, how does the universe uh, do it? How does it even produce such high energy particles, uh, you know, and at the you know, collider experiments, for instance, at CERN, people do uh, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of efforts to accelerate particles up to 10 TeV, which would be uh, just here. And, but then, you know, that's it. That's what you can do on Earth. You can't go higher right now. And the universe does the job, in a sense, a million times better. So you push, it pushes the energy limit much higher. So 
that's uh, sort of that's the challenge understanding the high energy universe and we need a new messenger if photons can't do it you have to do it with other messengers uh, protons uh, though they don't work because they're deflected by magnetic fields neutrons decay gravitational waves they don't really tell you about these um, you know super high energy events of course very extreme events but not these kinds of events so uh, what's left is the neutrino the neutrino does not have the problem it's being produced in the same location but then neutrinos don't uh, are not deflected because they're neutral and they're not absorbed by uh, by uh, you know foreground radiation or dust or so because they only interact weakly so the the solution at least one solution to starting to explain uh, you know what's going on in this energy range is to actually use neutrinos as messengers now that sounds fairly simple but actually finding neutrinos is not so simple and so what we have been doing over the last years we have been actually building and operating very very large neutrino detectors and the largest neutrino detector could even say the largest detector is actually the ice cube um, experiment which uh, we are um, involved in a daisy so and and um, and so you know our group is actually the the second largest group in the project it's it's us led but we are within europe actually half of the authors uh, sit outside of the us and in berlin we are having uh, the the second largest group out of, outside of the university of wisconsin and so we are you know we you don't see ice cube here this is the south pole the ice cube is sort of just under the ice the ice at the south pole is three kilometers thick and between 1.5 and 2.5 kilometers, the, the ice is very transparent. And so we deployed a, a detector into this ice, and this is how it looks like. So altogether, it spans uh, one cubic kilometer volume. And whenever a particle moves through this volume, if, if it's charged, it will leave a trace, and that trace we can reconstruct. And from the from the direction, for instance, from the from the pattern of the light inside of this uh, array. Of, of light sensors, we can reconstruct the direction. And in 2013, we have been able, so that was just two years after uh, we have started to operate IceCube. IceCube is now already, uh, what is it, 11 years old, uh, actually almost 12 years old uh, since completion. But it's it's taking data continuously. So we have an uptime of 99.8%, and we have a failure rate of our instrumentation of less than 1%. So it's it's aging remarkably good and that is has to do with the essentially that everything is frozen into ice um now since 10 years we've been now or 12 years we've been now hunting for cosmic neutrinos and these are the, some of the first cosmic neutrinos we identified so these actually are identified at pev energies 10 to the 15 electron volts so that's exactly where the um, universe becomes most opaque to electromagnetic radiation we were able to see those high energy neutrinos and, um, and so that was two years after the, you know, we switched on ice cube, we were suddenly quite confident that what, you know, these super bright, super intensive uh, events are cosmic neutrinos, neutrinos that are not produced on the earth or in the atmosphere, but really coming from somewhere. And if you look at the spectrum of these neutrinos, now this is uh, the spectrum multiplied with e to the power of two, so per logarithmic energy, there is just about equal amounts of energy in, uh, you know, in these different messengers. You're seeing here the photons and you, you know, it, it, uh, around 100 GeV, you see the absorption kicking in because these photons actually are from very distant uh, objects, mostly blazers, so redshift one objects. And so the photons are already absorbed away around 100 GeV. You're seeing here uh, the neutrinos that we have been uh, detecting, and here you're seeing the highest energy uh, cosmic rays that I have mentioned. And the interesting thing is that actually it's in terms of energy budget, there's just about as much energy in the gamma rays as there is in neutrinos as there is in cosmic rays, at least on the extra galactic side. So um, that's, uh, you know, that's intriguing. You would think, well, it's likely then it's the same source sources if they inject the same amount of energy into the universe then likely it's also the same uh, sources but it's not quite uh, this is not quite it so we know for gamma rays as i said it's mostly uh, blazers that contribute to the fermi gamma ray band so this is mostly fermi observations uh, that is shown here in our case for neutrinos we already know and i will talk, talk explain to you how we know this 
we know that the neutrinos are not from blazers. At least there's a small fraction from blazers, but not more than probably 10%. Uh, the rest then needs to come from somewhere else. And from cosmic rays, we actually know, don't know anything where they come from. And so this is still a mystery which we want to uh, resolve using neutrinos. And so the question that drives us, you know, it drives us, it almost drives us <laughs> crazy, we would say, is what are the sources of high energy neutrinos? We know there is high energy emission. We know there are high energy neutrinos, but where are they coming from? And uh, so neutrinos have the advantage, as I said, that they are uh, traveling straight. And so you can ask the first question is, so let's put them on a sky map, ask the question, where do I, uh, you know, where do I see the neutrinos from? And what you're seeing here is a sky map of cosmic neutrinos. So that's a subsample of the neutrinos that IceCube is seeing, for which we are fairly confident, let's say 50% or larger, that they are, these are of astrophysical origin. So we have about 1 million uh, events, neutrino events, for which we would say these are neutrino events, uh, but where uh, we are not confident that they are of cosmic origin. So most of them are actually produced in the atmosphere. Of these neutrinos, we think they are... Um, of uh, of cosmic origin, and then we have multiple ways to say it's cosmic or not cosmic. One way is actually to simply ask for the energy. If the energy is high, if it's larger than 200 TeV, it's unlikely that it's produced on Earth. So then, uh, you know, it's more likely that it's cosmic because the spectrum is actually it's not it's the atmospheric neutrinos are falling quickly, while the um, Astrophysical neutrinos are almost uh, have a, a spectrum of e to minus 2.5, so it's fairly hard. And when you're looking at how the neutrinos are distributed, you're seeing that they are fairly uniformly distributed. So you're learning there are two things you can read off this map, and you don't even have to do fancy statistics. One is that uh, they, they are this looks extra fairly uh, extra galactic. A fairly isotropic, which is and, and not aligned with the galactic plane, which is here. So, you know, from this immediately, you know, if it's, you know, if it's extra galactic, just like with GRBs, people knew, uh, yeah, sorry, if it's isotropic, then it's extra galactic, as, as uh, a similar case as was made early on in GRB uh, phenomenology. The second thing is that there is no obvious clustering. So you, it's not like you're seeing one hotspot of five uh, neutrinos. And so there's no indication here for a source. That doesn't mean that there is, are no sources. Probably every neutrino points back to a source, but we cannot make the argument just based on, on neutrinos. Now, I mentioned that this is only a small subset of uh, neutrinos that we have. We have a million uh, neutrinos and you can do a proper clustering analysis of these million neutrinos. And this is what we have just uh, released last year. So this is a, a neutrino sky map of 1 million neutrinos. Here, individual neutrinos are not distinguishable. So you do not know whether it's produced in the atmosphere or in the cosmos, most of them are actually produced in the atmosphere. You're just asking, is there a hotspot? Is there you know, a, an excess sort of in the autocorrelation function? You can measure it in, in different ways. And the answer is yes, there are some. You know, it's, uh, they are not overwhelmingly significant, but we have been just, you know, this, uh, I think in, what was it, in November, we have released, uh, you know, the, some our most significant observation, which is 4.2 sigma result from NGC 1068, which is a nearby galaxy, already Messiah was identifying this as, as uh, you know, as an interesting object. And uh, so, so this is, uh, you know, we found very likely emission from uh, this AGN. We have also here, you see two other hotspots. These are uh, two blazers, and I'll talk about this. In particular, uh, our Texas blazers, I, I will talk uh, a little bit later. It's, it's also beyond, it's more than three sigma, but uh, I think the significance is around 3.2 sigma, but there's more evidence that this, uh, source is actually producing neutrinos. I'll talk about this. So this is uh, essentially um, what we can do just with neutrino data alone. And it, you know, you see it already, it's, it's possible, but it's hard. It's hard work and it has some limitations. So what we are doing is now sort of is the multi-messenger approach where we say, let's combine the neutrino data with other 
uh, astronomical data and see if we can see and identify other sources. And we do this in real time because these sources often are variable. Blazers can be, you know, go up and down in terms of activity, but also some classes are entirely gone. So if, if a neutrino would be produced in a supernova, then, you know, the supernova would explode, produce a neutrino, then, uh, you know, it would be gone. So you would never be able, if you would look later on, you would never be able to find anything. So we need to search for the sources in real time. And that's what we are doing. And so we have started in 2016 to actually put all the analysis online. And um, so, not you know the, we have essentially we're doing the neutrino search uh, on uh, on separate computers and then when we find something where we are confident that this is a cosmic neutrino then we send out an alert to the public based on you know on on individual neutrinos and so this is the first uh, neutrino that we send out the first alert and we have observed it then uh, essentially yeah, the same team. It was us then together with uh, our colleagues from PanStars. We have then had a small observational campaign to look for these neutrinos. And we were terribly excited immediately because we found a, a supernova in the error footprint of uh, an ice cube neutrino. Now, it turned out, it's sort of for us, it's mostly interesting for historic reasons. It turned out that this is a likely 1A. And 1As are, it's very hard to come up with a mechanism to produce high energy neutrino emission for 1As. There's simply not enough energy in the system being released to, to, and, you know, um, to, to, to be a credible source. So in the end, after some work, we were thinking, well, this was a fun coincidence, but it's likely not uh, that interesting. So, but we continued and, uh, and uh, let's see if this works. This is a, So what this is, of course, you know, we are correlating also with uh, the gamma ray sky. That's in a sense a, a good match because it's both as high energy radiation. The gamma ray sky, as we observed with Fermi here, this is the FAVA real time analysis uh, or variability analysis. You know, you're seeing the essentially the the sky lighting up, and um, and in 2016, that's the start of the neutrino alerts, and then we were looking routinely for for coincidences between our neutrinos. And uh, you know at this Fermi variability analysis, and in in 2017, and it's interesting because it's just a month after the kilonova uh, was uh, detected in the optical in coincidence with gravitational waves, we saw this flaring blazer in coincidence with one of our high energy neutrinos, and um, and that was very exciting for us, and it triggered a lot of follow up observations. Um, you know, and it ultimately became our what we thought at that time, you know, was our first credible source candidate. And so we had two sets of observation. We had this coincidence, and then we had in addition our flare analysis of neutrinos, just neutrino data itself, and both gave us roughly three sigma evidence that this is a, a true coincidence. Now, this is just a, a visualization that we have uh, produced and uh, just it's it's of course just artistic but it's kind of nice to look at but it does since since sort of 2017 or we published the papers only in 2018 actually we have learned a lot about this particular source you can only make it work if you have sort of multiple zones producing the emission and the jets need to for instance be uh, structured Otherwise, you're not going to explain the data. And uh, it turns out that you can prove that these structures jets are actually really there. They have made uh, radio observations of, of the source and they have been able to resolve that this, uh, indeed the structured jets, they seem to exist. Now, if you put it together, you know, I've showed you two source candidates. One was an AGN and the second was uh, this blazer, this Texas blazer. And you know, you, you ask how much do they contribute to the diffuse flux? So this is the neutrino flux that we are observing from all over the universe. And this is uh, the AGM. You see it's falling steeply. And then you have the blazer here active at higher energies. It's it's so you know it's it's right now it's not easy to explain the whole spectrum, the whole diffuse spectrum of high energy neutrinos with uh, these source classes. Uh, one thing we are doing is, of course, we are looking for more blazers. We are finding other coincidences. Here you're seeing as a function of redshift, all our coincidences that, uh, you know, we have, you know, we, we, which we see on top of all the blazer population. But in any case, 
if you, you know, you, we cannot explain more than 10% of the diffuse flux right now, the flux of cosmic high energy cosmic radiation with blazers. And so 90% in a sense is still up, uh, up for grabs. And I don't think AGNs will work very well because they, they are falling, at least those, the one which we observed, it has a spectrum that falls too quickly. So what do we do? Well, we have to continue hunting for the sources. And so we are trying to essentially get better in doing this. And uh, the key here is to automate things. And, uh, you know, the in terms of building the perfect multi-messenger detector, actually a, a, a particle physics experiment like ATLAS is, is really, you know, an order of magnitude more efficient. I mean, there you have all the different components detecting muons, detecting photons, detecting you know, electrons, everything working together, triggering each other and speaking to each other within microseconds. And then the detector is being read out and so on. So it's it's a beautiful multi-messenger detector if, if it were actually a telescope, unfortunately it isn't. So, you know, that's the major drawback. So we need to think about how do we actually automate our instrumentation, you know, the, uh, and I think Black Hole Tom is actually a great, um, a great example. So here I'm a little bit probably teaching to the, to the, uh, preaching to the choir, uh, you know, what do we need to do? This is something you're all familiar with. Conventional astronomy is slow. There's always a human in the loop. It takes time to schedule. So when you do transient astronomy with optical telescopes, it kind of limits anything to you know order maybe a hundred objects per year you, it's just too many people have to you know it takes a day or two or so to, so to identify something to schedule something and then you know at best you 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 can observe a hundred per year and, and in order to speed things up we have to take the human out of the loop and we have to essentially uh make um th these decisions should i follow th things up or not and so on uh through computers and this is what we have been trying to to do over the last few years so let me just show you uh, you know the work which we've been doing so i'm i'll be speaking about tricky transient facility now so i'm i think everyone here with you know so much ogre you 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 know ztf i don't have to explain this to you but it's not just the it's not just the imager it's also what makes ztf special is that you you know it's it it actually has this uh, P60 telescope. So this is uh, this is the Schmidt telescope here, but this is the uh, uh, 1.5 meter uh, optical telescope with uh, um, IFU spectrogram, and it's really optimized for follow-up. And this combination allows us to do lots of spectroscopic confirmation of our detections. And so this works hand in hand. So this is a uh, this is just a picture of the Schmidt telescope. We have totally refurbished this. What we have at Daisy provided is the shutter, and because the shutter can't be inside of the tube, it had to be out, you know, it would block the light. It had to move, be moved outside. So as a result, it was very, very, it had to become very large, and uh, was also quite fun uh, to to build. And uh, and so ZTF has been operating things since two thousand eighteen, and uh, this year is actually the the last year of the nominal second survey. So uh, we are now in our sixth, sixth year of operation of five, right, five and a half or so. This is the field of view of ZTF uh, on the right hand side, and you can compare it to your favorite uh, telescope on the left hand side. So, you know, it's, uh, we just have a lot of, we're covering a lot of uh, area on the sky. We're certainly not the biggest telescope, but the product of size and uh, of telescope area and, and, Field of view is uh, right now is is sort of the, the largest. So the issue is, of course, ZTF detects lots of variable objects, lots of transients, and we are we are uh, one thing we have implemented at the Humboldt University and at Daisy is a is a software called Ampel that actually deals with all the uh, ZTF alerts. So there's a Kafka stream coming essentially from. Uh, University of Washington, it will look exactly the same for LSST, not exactly the same, but very similar for, for LSST. It's, then it's just going to be a factor of 10 larger. So this stream of uh, data sort of is coming. And then we need to, um, you know, we uh, essentially it's just, it, it's, you know, has there been any variability? It's just the difference, uh, the differences between one night and a new night an old reference night and a new night. And, um, you know, if it's significant enough, then it creates an alert. So it's anything, variable stars. Uh, you know, this is something you, you have experienced here. We are, of course, mostly interested in supernovae. 
but it's all in the data. And what we're doing is we're processing this data stream continuously. And then when we see something that is interesting, then we trigger follow-up observations. So the software which we have developed for this is called Ampel. And um, yeah, it runs, as I said, continuously. And we it's the analysis done in, in, in Kia. So we do some simple filtering and then we do more uh, refined analysis of the data, light curve fitting and so on, and based on the decisions of uh, the, re based on the results, we then make our decisions. Okay, so what have we detected? Well, first of all, of course, lots of supernova. And uh, for a while we were the, um, I mean, ZTF detects, makes the detection. So the fo photons fall onto the camera and then the, the pipeline of CTF identifies the alerts, but then someone needs to put this together. It's just a stream of alerts that this is actually a supernova and not just a variable star or something. And so we have some uh, pre-classification schemes. And then when we when we are confident it's a supernova, we, for instance, send a node to TNS, a uh, transient name server operated by Weizmann. And then, um, and then people can schedule spectroscopy time. We also, at the same time, will schedule uh, spectroscopy, spectroscopy time for our most favorite objects and, and classify them. And then once we have classified it, we will send the classification to TNS. So it's sort of this loop where, uh, you know, if, uh, a few databases talk to each other. So we so far, we've, we've seen several thousand uh, supernovae alone, uh, alone just supernova 1a, we have found 3,000 already. And um, and so supernova of type 1a are interesting, not for high energy neutrinos, but for other things. And that's also something we do at the Humboldt University. We uh, do supernova cosmology with them. And one thing we can do, for instance, we can look for lens objects. Super, I have nothing on, on lens supernovae in, uh, in this talk because this is about multi-messenger, but you can use the same machinery. And you can ask, for instance, on the fly, is it does it fit the Hubble diagram or is it maybe a lens large enough so that it's outside? And you will know immediately, you know, during the same night that it's a candidate for a lens supernova. And you with galaxy catalogs and so on to check this. So this is also ongoing. This is something you can do automatically. Something else we are doing is we when we detect a supernova, when when we detect an object in a nearby galaxy. We can, uh, we and it's, you know, we we can if it's near if it's if the galaxy is nearby and there was a big brightening, then we know it's actually a supernova. It's uh, you know if it's if it's a nova, it would not become as bright as quickly. So if it's uh, if it gets bright within one night, then we know we found a very early supernova. We can then schedule uh, spectroscopy time during the same night as we're making the detection of the supernova and get the, you know, a very early observation of supernovae. And that's something that uh, the Weizmann, our colleagues at Weizmann Institute have pioneered. So this is called flash spectroscopy. Essentially you're seeing sort of the atmosphere of the star as it's, uh, the stars exploding on the inside. You still see sort of uh, the outside atmosphere and you see sort of interesting uh, features in, in, in these spectra. And so they allow you to, to say things about the progenitors and so on. So this is uh, interesting. It's possible due to this high degree of automatization. Okay, gravitational follow-up, uh, uh, wave follow-up. I'll maybe not speak about this, but this is also something which profits greatly from uh, automatization because you need to be fast. You can't just look through the data by eye. I want to talk about a uh, neutrino follow up and and so what this pie chart shows you is essentially which how many alerts have we been able how many neutrino alerts have we be able to follow up with ztf and so when we see it when we have a neutrino alert coming in we try to sort of point our telescope our ztf to that uh, neutrino and see is anything interesting going on from this range and we've been able to follow up 35% of our Data And so what I will now talk about is what we have found. So this, um, you know, it's roughly one year into the survey, there was one neutrino here you know, in, in 2019 of 200 TeV. What this shows here is the dust layer. So the ice is transparent, but it's not, that's, it's not perfectly pure. So there's actually, his, it's the his history of the climate imprinted into the ice. And there's a big, uh, you know, there was big volcanic uh, activity a few hundred thousand years ago, and, and that shows up here in this dust layer. But 
it's okay. I mean, the neutrino seems to come out of this uh, dust layer, so it goes uh, upward. And um, we have slewed sort of ZTF to this direction. This is the error uh, footprint and, um, of the neutrino. And we have actually identified an interesting object. It wasn't uh, a supernova. It turned out to be a tidal disruption event. So what we have been doing actually to detect tidal disruption events is we had a filter that's, uh, you know, it's, it's been implemented by the TDE working group. And it's also the same working group is now implementing, um, not the same, but the similar working group now working for LSST is implementing uh, the TDE uh, um, filter into Ampel to operate on LSST data. So what it really does is um, it, I'm sorry, I, I should, uh, it, um, I'm, 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 I should, I should step one back. Step, I should step a little bit back. So we have filters on run, running on Ampel, which do uh, source class source identification. I have mentioned the TDE filter, but we have also filters that look for neutrino coincidences, and uh, they both work in in concert. So we have the what I've just described is a TDE filter. So. You know, we find a transient, we ask, for instance, is it close to the core? And if so, um, then it's a, a candidate for a TDE, and then we can take uh, extra data. And this way, we produce a TDE data set, so TDE tidal disruption events. The neutrino search program then runs on, um, on all of the optical transients that we are finding, and we, it's asking, is it an interesting optical transient that we are finding inside of the error contour? And these two sort of together, they have produced this coincidence. And um, so this is sort of just explaining roughly the algorithm. And so this is the, this was done by my uh, PhD student, Robert Stein. And so this is uh, the result of, the, this is the light curve uh, as uh, of the tidal disruption event. I, you know, if I, if you haven't heard about the tidal disruption event, I have a, a video and I'll show in this in a second. But it just sort of goes up. We and then it falls on a time scale of let's say fifty days. Interestingly, we found the neutrino here at uh, day uh, one hundred eighty after the first detection. So this is something that is, uh, you know, it, it's it, it's surprising a little bit. But um, you know, that's at least how how it came. And uh, so it could be some uh, triggered accretion. Uh, change or we don't know if it's if it's uh, it's ultimately I mean there are models for this but it's uh, we have not yet uh, I would say fully understood it it's also not hugely uh, significant so it has a p-value of roughly um, two times 10 to the minus three so you know it's not quite three sigma so it could just be a chance coincidence however you know just roughly a year later uh, another PhD student oh you know we our program, you know, operated by our PhD students sort of found uh, a second coincidence, uh, which this time is actually uh, much more, much uh, more luminous. And uh, so this is the first TDE that I have just explained. And this is the second TDE uh, that we have uh, identified. Now, initially, this, uh, so it, it, it was not obvious what it is because it was more, made more complicated because it's uh, it wasn't on a quiescent galaxy but on top of an AGN, and so one has to prove that it's not AGN activity and one should also prove that it's not just a super luminous supernova, and so we have actually looked put together a bunch of different data sets and we think we can prove that it's actually a tidal disruption event. So uh, this is just how the time evolution of the second object looks like. And um, so here's the, this is the optical data. Again, the neutrino came late. And, uh, but if you look at the optical data, so this is the, um, you know, this is, this is the optical band. What you're seeing here is, is the near infrared band or the mid infrared band we, as observed with the uh, near wide mission. And the interesting thing is that this, we, we, we didn't see this initially, but later we saw that this is sort of coming in and it becomes dominant. So suddenly the near infrared emission or mid infrared emission becomes dominant at later times. As the optical component falls, you, you have a rising uh, infrared component, which is this dotted line here. 
So you have this optical strong, optical large, very you know optical burst of light, and then you have a slowly evolving um, infrared emission. And this was new, so we didn't. I mean, it was seen before in other TDEs. It's a, a infrared echo. Essentially, what's happening is you have the radiation of the optical or UV burst sort of heating up the dust environment, and then the dust sort of this large. Uh, volume that uh, of dust is then radiating and it's delayed essentially due to the geometrical path it takes for the light to actually go to the dust layer and then fall into the eye of the observer. And so that's this, uh, this, this dust echo. And the interesting thing is we later then went back to our first CDE and it showed exactly the same light echo. And these are incredibly intense light echoes. Uh, they are the coverage factor in terms of how much dust there needs to be in the system is much larger than in other uh, previously found TDEs. So anyway, this is interesting. It's certainly much larger than you would also expect for any supernova. So uh, this is just a, an, another video that uh, you know that illustrates this. Uh, does it work? I'm not sure. Maybe I should skip the video. I'll turn this off the video. Um, okay, so this is I, I, this is you know again artist uh, impression, but I, I I like it. It's it has not been. We wanted to. It came too late for our press release for the paper. So now I'm just, I can just show these videos. But we kind of create these uh, we can create these videos to accompany the the press releases because it just helps. People like it, and uh, so here you're seeing. I didn't explain what a TDE is, but I'm. Uh, but here you're seeing the star coming in. There's a supermassive black hole, and then the star is being ripped apart. That's the tidal due to tidal forces, and then you're creating uh, these accretion disks. And the cool thing is, of course, with an AGN. On if you're combining a TDE with an AGN, is that you have the accretion disk due to the AGN, and on, on then you have this extra accretion. Um, Due to the tide disruption events, they don't they, they don't have to align. They will actually not align uh, by nature, so they will be just randomly oriented. And so you will have a you you have a fairly complex system, and uh, but at the same time you can imagine that this will be very disruptive too. So it might have been a, a steadily accreting AGN before, but then eventually that isn't. And so uh, what you're seeing then is I'm not sure where I'm on this video is that now this you know it's very hot as it, it's the we we find these CDEs are something the radiation they, they the temperature we fit is something like fifty thousand Kelvin and the UV radiation actually evaporates the dust so you know the the reason why it's you see this delay is you have this uh, the, the dust is actually being evaporated and so you have these shells of ten I don't know ten to the eighteen centimeters or so. Of a dust and everything inside has been uh, um, essentially um, depleted, and so you're heating these, these sort of you, so you have a void, and then on out, outside of that void you'll have the dust, and uh, this dust is then being heated and radiates in the infrared, and that sets the the time scale of the whole thing. Okay, um, so this is uh, let's see. This is what we have been doing with IceCube and with um, uh, and, and ZTF. So let me show you what we will do now for the last few minutes. I, I, I think 10 more minutes or so, and then I'll be I'm done. So, you know, we think it worked well. What should we do next? Well, uh, you know, we want to uh, do this better. And one way to do this better is to uh, have better instruments. And so we are working on Ultrasat. In fact, we've decided to work on Ultrasat already 2019. So before we found these TDEs, but that gave us an extra, now it gives us an extra motivation. Um, so Ultrasat is a, is a, it's a satellite mission that uh, the PI is Eli Waxman of the, from the, of the uh, um, Weizmann Institute of Science, but in uh, but he we we have joined as Daisy the mission uh, in uh, 2019, and we are building the the camera for for the satellite, and so it's a German Israeli mission, Israeli and German mission right now. We are the junior partners in this, and uh, it will launch in um, end of 2015 or early 2016. 
So it's it's not a huge uh, camera. So it has a, a no, it, yeah, it has a 50 centimeter diameter mirror, and um, but it has a huge field of view. So it, a field of view of 15 by, times 15 square degrees, uh, so 225 uh, square degrees, and um, and it's optimized because you know it's observing in the UV band between 220 and 280 nanometers. It doesn't have any filters, just this one uh, UV filled uh, band. And uh, and the trick is, and I explain this in a second, is that it's you know very good for detecting hot sources. It's very poor if it's a cool source, but for hot sources it has an advantage. And with a large field of view, we can of course then uh, scan huge areas. And so for uh, for kilonova detection, which are associated with gravitational waves, you know, neutron star mergers, it's going to be a blast. So it will be, uh, yeah, we can scan through thousands of, of square degree error ellipses of, uh, you know, that are typically associated with neutron star mergers as observed with LIGO and, 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 and quickly um, point out the, the counterparts. And, um, and, and so that's the main motivation for Ultrasat. If you want to compare Ultrasat to um, other missions in the optical, then uh, you can use this plot. This is called, it's, it's not very e easy to see, but it shows essentially how far, how deep you reach into the universe as a function of wave. And uh, Ultrasat actually is very comparable to LSST. How can that be? You, you wonder, you know, LSST with eight meter uh, mirror. How can it, you know, how can how can it be just remotely, uh, you know, as sensitive as as the small uh, telescope? Well, this is uh, of course uh, because the small telescope it would obs it observes in the UV, and uh, the UV ultimately is, um, you know, the, if it's a hot source, it radiates much stronger in the UV than it is in the optical. So this is one advantage. The second advantage is, of course, the size. Uh, the, the area that you can cover. So in terms of, if you ask how deep can you, you know, how far, you, you have more time per pointing or sort of per square degree to search uh, with our, uh, with Ultrasat because simply it has this large field of view. And so if you add everything to, uh, together, we can actually reach sort of if, in terms of searching for sources or detecting transits. <laughs> We can, uh, if they're just hot, so hot means uh, hotter than 15,000 Kelvin, we are um, as good as LSST with ultrasound. Okay, so this is just a, a picture of the uh, camera as it will look like. We have already, uh, you know, we are getting now the CMOS, it's going to be CMOS. Um, it will not be CCDs, but uh, CMOS. And we have, uh, you know, we have now, Prototype essentially, or that has, has been already happening last year. Now we are getting the the, the final CMOS to, and but we have pro, essentially qualified the prototypes. And what you're seeing here are it's the quantum efficiency measurement on the scouts, and they do have the sensitivity that is required. So we are seeing essentially eighty percent or more quantum efficiency around uh, two hundred fifty nanometers. So we were very happy about this. This is again a measurement we have done um, at DAISY. And so this is uh, just how how far we will be able to see. So what what I mean the, the poor thing about so on the right hand side you're seeing the limiting magnitude of ultrasound. So it depends on essentially the position on the focal plane, but it's maybe around 22 uh, magnitudes. And we will have multiple surveys, one high cadence, one low cadence survey. And uh, but we'll at all times be alerting uh, the being able to alert the telescope to point to any position in the sky if we find something interesting, and uh, then we will have a look. So, a, uh, you know, uh, a kilo like kilonova like object, uh, like AP 2017 GFO, we would see up to um, 240 megaparsecs in a 15 minute exposure. So, you know. It, that kilonova was detected at 40 kiloparsec, we'd be able to see it uh, detected at um, six times that distance. So, uh, and with that, of course, we are sensitive to much larger volumes and we should be able to see uh, hopefully tens of uh, kilonova counterparts to gravitational waves starting in 2016. 
but we'll also see a huge number of PDEs because they are hot. We'll be very sensitive to those. And, and so, the, you know, we are expecting to see more than, more than a thousand PDEs per year. And the interesting thing is we should be able to see them up to a redshift of one. So this will be uh, allowing us to do some very interesting measurements in terms of, you know, the evolution of these objects. And then lots of supernovae. And in particular, that is a, a pleasant surprise. Supernova of 1A, we have done just this preliminary study, and we think that they are actually quite strong, quite strongly emitting in the UV. So likely we'll find uh, those of, uh, some of those too. So, um, so this is Ultrasat. Ice Cube, we're gearing up uh, for uh, a follow-up mission just as well. This is called Ice Cube Gen 2. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll not talk about this. It's, it keeps me busy, but um, you know, it's, it's like Ice Cube, but just 10 times larger. Um, maybe that's all I need to say. And uh, But if you combine everything, if you combine an improvement in, in neutrinos, and if you're combining an improvement in follow-up facilities and, and uh, you know, optical and ultrasound uh, you, in, in, in the UV, you should be, we should be able to see more associations similar to what I've just shown you. So I've shown you two associations, two possible or likely associations with TDEs, so neutrinos from TDEs. Assuming this is right, we can extrapolate what will happen in the next few years. So the first thing here you're seeing is, so the, what you're seeing here is the number of associations per year. And right now we are here. So ZTF allows us to see roughly up to a redshift of 0.1. And we are seeing maybe half an association per year. We've been operating for a few years, okay? And so this is what, where we are right now. Now with ultrasound or LSST, we should be able to push to a redshift of 0.5 at least. In terms for TDEs, now this will depend on the survey, on the on the source class, but for um, you know for TDEs it would be up to a redshift of 0.5, and uh, as a result we should be seeing several of these uh, coincidences uh, per year. So this would be uh, already quite interesting, I think. And then if you switch on Ice Cube Gen two, which is that new mission we are building, then the rates would go up even more you would uh, you know, see up to 10 of these associations per year. And so I'm using this as an example of how, how multi-messenger can actually work. So multi-messenger lives from actually observing the thing, you know, the sources in multiple, through multiple ways. And if one improves, you win. If both improve, you win like, the square root of you know, your improvement. It's, it's really, uh, you know, goes hand in hand. And uh, if we are lucky, you know, it will be a, a, simply a fantastic time. And we'll be seeing plenty of these uh, sources and we can then finally understand really how the high energy universe works. Okay, and so we'll be able to do source population studies, just like uh, conventional astronomy, uh, you know, we'll be able to, um, you know, trying to understand really the mysteries of these objects. Okay, so this is already uh, my everything. So this is my conclusion. So I think it's clear multi-messenger uh, astronomy during the last few years has already uh, produced some quite interesting uh, breakthroughs. I mean, of course, everyone knows about gravitational waves, but also neutrinos have been uh, quite interesting. And uh, and a lot of it is essentially all, uh, is in the real-time domain. In the And we profit enormously from building better tools that automate things. And, and we will be able, and it's actually a must. If you want to really go to the next level with new observatories, you have to bring things together. You have to automate things. But we are in a good, good track. So we are almost there. And um, and so it will, just, uh, it will just get better with upcoming observatories. Some are really already almost there, LSST. Uh, I should say Ampel is a LSST broker, so we will be getting all the, of the uh, LSST data anyway. Just uh, maybe half a year later, we'll get the Ultrasat data. And, um, and then we have the neutrino data, the other observatories coming online. We're merging everything into this uh, sort of stack software framework and ultimately, yeah. We, we don't quite know yet what we'll discover, but there's plenty of great data and we are uh, excited to, to see. Okay, so thank you. And um, I'll stop here. Thank you, Mike. A very interesting talk. Are there questions here in the audience? Patrick. So I would like to ask about ice. 
Uh, first of all, uh, as was that uh, the artist transparent now that the experiments start to work. And second, uh, what are the crystalline phases of time that are uh, and in depth down to the kilometer? Yeah, so it's it really becomes transparent only at 1500 meters. Um, and the weird, the interesting thing is that above 50, you know, initially people have tried to actually do neutrino astronomy already in thousand meters um, depth because models predicted that the ice should be already transparent, but it turned out not to be transparent. What 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 happens is that you have uh, air bubbles trapped in the ice, and these air bubbles are being actually if the if you increase the pressure, the air uh, the air bubbles are being dissolved into the ice structure. And that makes only, and that happens only around uh, 1400 meters below uh, depth, and it's only uh, 1450. And it's actually this is absolutely necessary. If if this is not the, you know, if you're not resolve, uh, dissolving the air bubbles, then uh, you you it's like milk. And uh, in fact, you know, the early uh, instruments, Amanda A was called. It was not detecting anything because it was simply in the wrong location. Okay, and what are the phases of the ice? Like these crystalline phases, are there multiple of them? No, I don't think so. I don't, not at this, um, in, in that, at that pressure. It's just, I think it's, I think it's fairly standard uh, ice, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I have a few questions. The first one is, uh, do you think, uh, there are any ideas of new rays or when we don't have to accept that we can try from anything. I I mean, you know, cosmic ray scientists will say they can resolve them too. I mean, but they have just a point spread function of 90 degrees. Um so I think and you know, if you just look long enough, you'll you know you you, you I mean, you're an expert in astronomy. I mean, but I mean, you ultimately will uncover maybe one source. I don't think that's the. It's not my. I think they and ultimately had a hundred years to figure it out. So I'm I'm kind of a little bit impatient, and I would not um, bet on you know a, a fast answer anytime soon. So I think it's. Uh, I think the answer will come from neutrinos. I think it's. I mean, the if you're producing cosmic rays, if you're then uh, you don't absolutely, not necessarily you produce high energy neutrinos, but most of the times you do. And so for sure, wherever, when we detect high energy neutrinos, these are sources of high energy cosmic rays. And, um, and so I think it's, you know, the, the, that we are finding neutrinos, even if they're subdominant from, from blazers, means that blazers are producing high energy cosmic rays. Maybe not to 10 to the 20 electron volts, maybe just to 10 to the 18 electron volts. But we, uh, but that would be one candidate. The other is TDEs. They could also produce cosmic rays up to 10 to the 18 electron volts, uh, maybe even higher. So the, you need modeling right now to answer this, and uh, and people are doing this. Ultimately, we are also building a new array of um, neutrino detectors that operate up to 10 to the 20 electron volts, and so. We are building, um, we are involved in, in one of the missions in um, where we are building a radio neutrino detector in Greenland. And, and that's, that works very well. We already have the largest detector. Um, it's not sensitive enough to, to meet the predictions, but I think in three, four years, we will uh, have the sensitivity to actually detect the first sources. And if we are finding neutrinos not at one PEV, but let's say at 10 to the um, 18 electron volts, so EEV, then that are the sources of, of cosmic rays as well. So I believe that neutrinos will provide the answer. I see, thanks. And my second question is, is there an estimation how long will the first uh, current as before? Because it's so dark as well. So, and this is the I mean, you can, yeah, it's, a, it's, I mean, it's one thing to know how long it can run and another how long we can get funding. Um, so I think people will eventually get bored. And I, I'm, Right now, people are not bored at all. It's it's actually a very lively uh, collaboration, and uh, we are still also doing great science. I would say we have now um, uh, a new. I haven't talked about this, but we are building. It's called the Ice Cube Upgrade, and it will actually. So, I mean, two thousand five, two thousand six will be terribly uh, exciting for me because we are deploying uh, a seven string uh, and 
extension of IceCube Detect. It's not quite IceCube Gen 2 yet. It's we are building new technology. And, um, and so this will produce very good neutrino physics uh, with this new upgraded detector. And I think we will, so I, I think we will get, we, I'm very convinced that we will have funding for at least 15 more years. Um, beyond that, we will need a new detector. And I scoop Gen 2 will ultimately, there's just no point operating, a, you know, a detector for too long. You don't learn so much new. So I think beyond that, we, in, in 10 years from now, roughly, we will need ice cube Gen 2. Okay, so uh, and that is not funded yet. We we have we have right now we have like a three hundred page design document ready that uh, we will ship to the funding agencies and we are asking them to to fund us. We were um, we were very highly ranked on the decadal survey in the U.S. and so I'm 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 optimistic that that we will make uh, progress very soon. Okay, thank you. Mr. I, I would like to ask you about the origin, the possible origin of neutrinos during the production of stars. You mentioned that, that it stopped here when they come from, but can you speculate a little bit about the physical mechanism which can produce the neutrinos in such a quite late phase of this? Yes, uh, uh, happy to speculate. So I think, I mean, one of the things is that it's, uh, you know, you have a continu uh, continuous central engine. That um, and what one thing we have found in our for we have did, did done very um, systematic radio follow up observation of our first TDE, and we have seen that there are outflows, and uh, we have also seen that these outflows have uh, that they appear to accelerate as a function of time. So this acceleration you can only achieve ultimately, we, you, you could only explain our radio data by having a central engine that continuously powers the flow outflows. And, 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 and so the accretion, in a sense, it has to, it, it, it's not going to fall to zero, but you will, it transitions into a new state maybe after 50 days, and then it could ultimately, um, you know, these outflows, it, it can power the outflows and the outflows, for example, there can be shock interactions of the outflow with a circumstellar medium or outflow with an outflow. So it's, uh, and, and so that would explain it, for instance. Um, not, not nuclear, nuclear reactions, it will be shock acceleration, it will be in, in, in one way or another. So you need to have collisions um, in shocks. Um, and so you need, uh, some, I mean, ideally we'd like relativistic outflows, but one can also do it with sub-relativistic outflows. And, um, and then you have acceleration on, on the boundary of, of the shocks. And uh, that's how you accelerate particles. At least that's the conventional picture of a particle acceleration. But you need um, shocks and you need lots of energy. We, we think the energy is just, a, the bolometric energy we estimate for these sources, they, they, accre they accrete essentially at the Eddington limit. And that's, that's the, what you need. It's if our results are right, then it means that TDEs are extremely efficient particle accelerators. So you have to take a few percent of the energy and, and use it to accelerate particle. It's possible, but it would be also pretty remarkable. There is a somewhat related question on, on the chat. I will read it from Nadai Kanetz. Uh, thank you for a great uh, talk. Do you see any difference in neutrino detections originating from TDE and supernovae? Could you use a single detection to differentiate between TDEs and supernovae? Yeah, um, so the neutrino itself, we has it, lose, it, it has no information about its origin. It's not like gravitational wave, uh, gravitational waves, which have a, an imprint of, um, I guess, the progenitor. I mean, you know, it's uh, in gravitational waves, you can't resolve it yet, but eventually you can think of uh, resolving the equation of state or so from the, from the imprint of. In in uh, you know in the in in the signal of the inspire we don't have this. What neutrino are individual? These are single particles. They have very few quantum you know numbers associated with them, and so they they tell us nothing. They only think an individual neutrino. If you have multiple neutrinos, they tell us about the spectrum. So one neutrino can tell us about the energy. 
you know, two will already tell us whether it's, um, you know, the spectrum and, um, and, and, or, and the flux, maybe you need a third neutrino. So, so we need uh, essentially that and how, how it goes. So neutrinos don't, they, you, know, you need to uh, value each individual neutrino and, and learn the most. Uh, and then from a CD here, from our supernova, how many neutrinos in the run detect? I mean, you know, I showed you the two. Mm -hmm. So today I talked about four sources. Uh, the first was an AGN. This we have seen in our autocorrelation uh, function, and that was actually 80 neutrinos contributed to the signal. Uh, but, but all of these are low energy. So each individual neutrino were, not, we, were most likely not, um, not cosmic neutrinos, but background neutrinos. But we saw on top of the background that we expect 80 neutrinos, which we would uh, connect to, this, um, to the signal, to the AGN. And that is a pretty strong signal. Mm -hmm. Um, but the rest were just single neutrinos associated with the source. So one associated with the Texas blazer and two associated with two TDEs that we have seen. And that's it. That's why we need bigger detectors uh, right. because we want to, you know, increase the statistics. Right. I see a question from Martin. Could we add to the task for corporate and corporate neutrinos and detected by us? Estimation. Yeah, I mean, okay, we so Cocolab supernova are special because for sure they're producing neutrinos, but MEV neutrinos, low energy neutrinos. And so, yes, they are, but not with the methods I showed. But uh, we MEV neutrinos, they don't produce these tracks. You only see uh, the, the light of an MEV neutrino in, in the nearest sensor. And you see it because it's a very dark area. And, radio quiet environment. So our sensors have a noise rate of 500 Hertz. And so what happens is that you see one photon here and another there, and the overall rate of photons in the detector goes up. So we are seeing an extra noise contribution that comes in and it's, you know, and, and, and then it goes again, away again. And then we are very sensitive. So we can see, um, we, we can already with ice cube, we can would see a supernova up to 200 kiloparsecs uh, distance. Unfortunately, you know, our galaxy is, is limited. I mean, it's so 10 kiloparsecs, so that it, we don't gain much. There's just our, we can only see our galaxy. And, you know, the supernova rate in our galaxy is, uh, is fairly low, maybe one every 70 years. And so, so far as, you, you know, there's nothing. Um, 200, yes. So it, it, it includes LMC. Right? It includes LMC, yes, and uh, but it does not include Andromeda yet. Um, so Andromeda would be the first galaxy that would, in, in, in a meaningful way, increase, bump up the ray. Um, and I think it's right now, we, we no, no neutrino observatory has the sensitivity to go to Andromeda. So this is, uh, so it, it, we, we are sensitive. We would be seeing the rise and the features in the light curve. We would not resolve individual neutrinos. So this is this. And uh, we are also sensitive, of course, to models of a high energy neutrino production supernova because all the ingredients are there. You have, you know, but not one A's, but Cocolab supernovae. So you, the, you know, the, you have lots of shock interaction in, in, in the Cocolab supernova. And in fact, that was our initial motivation when we put together optical follow up program. We were hoping to detect Cocolab supernova uh, because they are such, they're almost like neutrino factories. Now we haven't seen anything yet. Doesn't mean it's not existing, but it's not such a strong signal. But okay, we also take TDEs. So. Well, there should be one in our galaxy, again, if there's one, right? Cocolab supernova. Any, what, what do you mean with any time? So and there's some people speaking, well, we are so much delayed that there should be one. <laughs> so you will see it first, I guess. Yes, we'll see it first. Okay, we'll let you know. Okay, good. Any more questions, comments? Yeah, no, I don't see anything on Zoom. Okay, so let's thank our speaker. Okay. I just wanted to say that's, that's very interesting. Yeah?